Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank everyone for coming along to this session uh, dedicated to soft matter. Um, my name is Adriano Tiribocchi, and I will chair this um, parallel session. So uh, I think we can start uh, um, the series of talks, uh, and uh, let's begin with uh, uh, Sergei Granados Leiva. I think, uh, let me know if uh, the pronunciation is fine, uh, from the University of uh, Barcelona. Uh, with, a with a talk titled Lattice Boltzmann Simulation of Inhibition, um, Inhibition, sorry, in Slippery Liquid Infused Porous Surfaces. Thank you. Uh, so please go. Okay. Uh, well, so yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, inhibition uh, simulation on slips uh, by means of Lattice Boltzmann. Uh, first, I will start uh, describing what are slips, uh, what are their properties. Uh, then I will briefly present the, the energy approach uh, we use to Lattice Boltzmann. And finally, I will show the uh, simulation results we have obtained so far. So uh, what are slips? Uh, slips are a uh, very an increasingly popular material uh, that consists uh, basically on, on a water immiscible liquid uh, uh, and a solid surface that has a very high affinity for this lubricant. And then this solid surface is texturized with some uh, structures uh, to increase the surface area so that uh, the lubricant is sta stabilized in the, in the solid surface. So why are these uh, materials so interesting uh, and popular? Uh, first of all, they are very low cost and simple and easy to manufacture. And they also stand like very uh, extreme conditions and salinity, pH and ultraviolet environments. Uh, and also some properties have been studied uh, for uh, slips and drops. And they have a, a lot of morphologies, like, for example, depending on the different surface tensions, we can have a, a, a lubricant that covers the whole drop or, or not, or we can have some distance in between the texturized solid surface uh, covered by lubricant, or we can have uh, just the drop uh, near the lubricant. Uh, also, from the dynamics uh, for, uh, point of view of the, of the drop, we also have some uh, interesting properties. Uh, for example, as a function of the tilted angle of the solid surface, uh, if the water, uh, if the oil uh, lubricant viscosity is, is, is large, uh, we see that there is a linear increase of velocity as a function of, of the tilted angle. Uh, and then if this uh, lubricant viscosity is small, uh, we see that we enter uh, a new regime that has two different exponents. Uh, and also the, the velocity depends on the texturization of the solid surface. So this, in this uh, article by Kester and colleagues, uh, they uh, state that this is a consequence of uh, the dissipation uh, that for uh, a small viscosity uh, lubricant, uh, this dissipation uh, is ruled by the, by the, by the lubrication. Uh, the, uh, yeah. And then for a, for a large viscosity of fluid, uh, it's ruled by, by the drop. So uh, it is interesting to think what will happen if, if now we have an imbibition in, in a system of two plates of, of slips. Uh, imbibition is a surface tension driving phenomena in which the, the affinity between two liquids and a solid produces a certain curvature. Uh, this curvature can cause a pressure drop uh, that forces the, the, the liquid to move. And we can observe different uh, regimes, uh, an early stage regime that is inertial, uh, and then a late stage regime that is ruled by dissipation uh, that consists, is called the lucas uh, regime. So this regime is asymptotically, yeah, and it's very easy to obtain an expression for this regime. We only need the uh, young Laplace and to assume that lucas Walshman follows a uh, post field flow. And with this, we follow, we, we can reach to this uh, analytical expression that it's uh, a square root uh, diffusive division. Here I show a typical uh, curve of this type. Uh, so now if we think of, of liquid uh, infinite surfaces, uh, first I want to be clear that uh, so far we are interested on the properties of, of, of planar uh, solid surfaces, so there is no textualization so far, uh, because first we want to understand the properties of the lubricant uh, upon the, 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 the division, and only in this uh, much more simple uh, ideal uh, setup uh, there is an additional set of parameters, like for example uh, the lubricant width and the lubricant viscosity, and also uh, there is a way in which that appears as a consequence of uh, the different surface tensions of the fluid. Uh, and we are interested in characterizing uh, the regimes of inhibition. 
So there is some question we can ask, uh, like for example, how will the lubricant modified inhibition, uh, how will be the, the new velocity profile in this uh, SLIPS configuration? Uh, how long will be the different dynamic regimes and how such properties will depend on these physical parameters? So uh, I'm not going to extend on the latifold approach because I think everyone in here will know what it's about. I only want to pinpoint that we use a, a multi relaxation time algorithm to stabilize the different viscosities of the different uh, components of the mixture. Uh, and also we will use a B3 accumulating uh, velocity set. Uh, for, the free, for, the, for simulating the three phases, we use a free energy approach. So basically we have this big free uh, energy from which we can uh, extract all the, the magnitudes of the problem, like the chemical potential, the concentration of the fluid flow. Uh, and also we can assume some, some, some stuff to make the, the description of the problem easier. Like for example, all the interfaces have the same width and then we have this uh, easy expression for the surface tensions. Uh, and then from this expression, we can obtain uh, the different uh, uh, wetting angles uh, between the fluids. Uh, there is also some uh, transformation of the variables we can make to make also the, the, the problem easier. Uh, and we can also impose some better boundary conditions. Uh, and from these wetting boundary conditions, we can even extract the, the analytical contact angle between fluids and solids. So we use uh, Lattice Bowman, uh, an open source code uh, called Lubitsch uh, that has the, the core of the algorithm already integrated. Um, I have been working with Professor uh, Pago Navarraga uh, in developing an approach uh, for this uh, methodology. And we use a, a different uh, setup than the one uh, that is used in the original article by Semprebon and colleagues, because we do not uh, use uh, two additional uh, distribution functions, but we solve the Cahillian equations uh, with this uh, discretization, and we have two mobility parameters. To couple the, the hydrodynamics and the force, uh, of the ternary uh, surface tension. We use the chemical potential, uh, the gradient of the chemical potential, uh, and uh, we, we can calculate the at each grid, uh, at each node, uh, the chemical potential and then discretize uh, the chemical potential. So with this approach, we can obtain very nice uh, agreements between the, the fluid fluid contact angles and also the solid fluid contact angles. Uh, and now I will present the, the simulation results we have obtained so far. So first of all, we reproduced the, the division of, of only two fluids in, in, in terms of this ternary free energy model. Uh, and we obtained uh, something that was already uh, obtained some years ago by Yeomans and, and, and other colleagues, uh, which is basically, uh, we can obtain an, an, an agreement of lucas Wajwa uh, using these parameters, for example, which is only an example. Uh, if we take into account that there is uh, some dissipation in the inlet and outlet of the system, uh, as a consequence of, of, the, of the reservoir uh, in which we have the two uh, mixtures of fluid. Uh, we also have to use not the, the equilibrium contact angle, uh, but the, the late stage measured angle, because this is the one that drives the division dynamics in, in, in our case. And with this, we can achieve this, uh, this nice agreement. So uh, from now on, I will, uh, we will keep uh, the, the physical parameters of the problem constant. Uh, which are in, for stabilizing the slips uh, lubricant, we are going to use complete wetting properties uh, of the, the lubricant with the, the other two fluids. Uh, and then we will uh, use surface tension such that we have these uh, contact angles. Uh, and this uh, eta is for the entrant fluid and for the displaced fluid, this is 0.1. And uh, the viscosity lubricant, uh, we, we can vary it to see uh, the different response to the system. So uh, here I, sh I show uh, an division with slips where the lubricant uh, viscosity is, is large. So we see that uh, the front advances in time and it, uh, it is not clearing here, but it's, slow, it's slowing down uh, as it advances. Uh, and then if we uh, use a smaller uh, viscosity of the lubricant, we also see division, but uh, we see two additional features that we didn't see before. Like for example, we see that there is an accumulation of fluid uh, towards the end of the channel due to the to large viscosity, uh, sorry, uh, due to a large uh, fluid flow in the lubricant. And then after we reach the end of the channel, uh, this uh, accumulation of fluid gets uh, redistributed. We can even see sometimes that uh, the division in, in, in this case of uh, small viscosity gives rise to, to a restoring flow uh, that uh, while the division happens, uh, tries to uh, 
to, to have a homogeneous uh, height of the, of the lubricant. So uh, here I show the results of the characterization of the, the average front position as a function of time. And we see that as the, as the front uh, is advancing, uh, there is a, a slowdown of the front, uh, which makes sense because at the end, we still have uh, that as the front is, uh, is advancing in, 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 in the position of the channel, the dissipation is increasing. And this is something that, uh, that will happen uh, no matter what, because uh, the, as the, the more viscous phase is entering the channel, this dissipation is increasing. So uh, we expected that we will observe uh, uh, this uh, slowdown of the front. But uh, we observe some different uh, behaviors, for example, for the contact angle. Because we see that we don't have this asymptotical uh, tendency towards the equilibrium angle. But instead, uh, for example, for the large viscosity, uh, we see that we start uh, from a large value of the, the uh, measured angle. And then we cross the equilibrium angle uh, of, of the entrant fluid. And then it starts to increase again. Then for the large, uh, for the small viscosity case, we see that uh, this uh, angle is increasing uh, monotonously uh, almost. So uh, we observe that, that we don't we have a collective uh, different behavior uh, on the on the equilibrium on the dynamic angle, and this dashed line uh, is a, a very similar simulation with the same physical parameters, but we use uh, a solid surface that has a larger affinity for the for the lubricant. And we see that this also modifies the, the angle that we can measure in the simulations. So we have also developed uh, some kind of, of, of uh, Lukas Warfum model that uh, introduces the, the lubricant uh, in this uh, simple fashion. So basically, we have this uh, contact angle uh, of, the, of the entrant fluid. That is an effective contact angle because we are not taking into account the, the structure of the width of the wetting width. Uh, and then we use three fluid flows, two for the, for the lubricant, uh, top and, and down and bottom. And then we use this velocity uh, flow for the center that, ha that has this John uh, uh, Laplace uh, pressure drop. We also use a, a, an effective pressure in the lubricant uh, to take into account uh, and to, to study the, the properties of, 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 the, uh, of this restoring flow that we, we see sometimes. Uh, for small viscosities. So we can set this effective pressure to zero uh, if we don't want to, to study this, this restoring flow, but we can use an effective pressure negative uh, if we want to characterize this restoring flow. So uh, with this approach, if we uh, follow the same uh, uh, steps as in Lucas Washburn, basically we, we found uh, the, 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 same, the same things as in Lucas Washburn, but we have uh, an additional uh, function that depends on the, on the lubricant width. Uh, the relative lubricant width and also the ratio of viscosities and uh, pressure. But at the end, we still have uh, one of which is what, expect, what we expected. Uh, if we now uh, plot some velocity profiles for a large and a small viscosity, uh, we see that for the, for the large viscosity case, we have something that is at the center very close to, to Lucas Washburn. We have a, a post-well flow and then a small uh, velocity profile in the lubricant. Uh, which makes sense because uh, if the if the liquidity is, is large, uh, we expect to find that uh, the lubricant is acting as, as a wall, uh, kind of. And then if the liquidity is, uh, is decreased and is small, uh, we find that we have a, a, a fluid flow that is very similar or is reminiscent of, of a plug flow. We see that there is a large gradient of velocity in the lubricant, and then we reach a post flow at the center of the channel. So now, if we use an effective uh, pressure that is negative, uh, we see that the, the, the profile for large viscosities is close to no modified. Is, uh, the maximum velocity is very similar. Uh, and then for the small viscosity case, we see that the maximum velocity uh, at the center of the, of the fluid flow is reduced to half. Uh, this is kind of reminiscent of what Kaiser and colleagues uh, found in one of these first slides, uh, where they stated that the when the lubricant viscosity is small, then the dissipation is, is root by the, by the lubricant and not by the drop, as happened when, for example, we don't have the lubricant and only have uh, the solid surface. So uh, we made some simulations, uh, and we found uh, qualitatively the same thing that we found, we found with our toy model. 
uh, which is that we can start from washroom here. Uh, this green uh, uh, simulation uh, has no lubricant on the, uh, the, the solid surface. And then and as we have we add the lubricant and we uh, decrease the velocity, we see that we, we are transitioning from something that is similar to washroom to this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, lubricant regime uh, by, by the lubricant. And uh, for a very uh, small viscosity, we, we, we see that we have this very similar uh, plug flow. Uh, and we also see this restoring flow in the, in the lubricant as a consequence of the interaction between uh, the complete weighting properties of the solid and, uh, and the front of the lubricant. So uh, we don't have a, a, a quantitative agreement, which makes sense because we are neglecting so far uh, the microscopic structure of the, of the bridge and also the accumulation of fluid. And we are also neglecting uh, the, the, the restoring flow, uh, the, the precise structure of the, the fluid flow and the force profile. Uh, but we have uh, the, the same quantitative uh, results, uh, which is nice. Uh, we found what we expected. Um, yeah, now we have like the basis of what we wanted to study. Uh, we would like to, to have uh, a unified descriptions of the dynamics of the of the front compared to the ridge. Uh, also, we would like to to introduce and extend our study to texturized surfaces, which are the ones that we can access to experimentally. Uh, and also, uh, we would like to characterize uh, uh, how long are the different regimes. For example, the inertial regime maybe can be uh, enhanced by means of this uh, uh, small uh, viscosity regime uh, that is ruled by the lubricant. And um, in the near future, we, we would like to, to, to make some, certain, some experiments to compare the simulations with, uh, with these experiments. So yeah, uh, this uh, will be my presentation. Uh, now, maybe I think we have four minutes. Uh, if you have any questions of what I have explained, um, yeah, this is everything. Any okay, thank you very much, uh, Sergi, for the nice presentation. So we're open to questions. We have a couple of minutes for some questions. Um, if you have any, please raise your hands or just ask. So I only have a technical one. Um, okay. Can I? Yeah, sure. So you mentioned yeah, at some point in your presentation that you mentioned the um, L, which is the, I mean, the, um, the size of the channel, right? Um, you mean L, yeah. you put 42, right? And, uh, and the length of the channel, uh, mm -hmm. the other length? Yes, I, I have it, uh, wait. Mm. Perhaps I missed it. Uh, yeah, here, uh, I think uh, I have here the length of the channel, the total length is 42, and the length of the, of the lubricant uh, layer is four. Well, this is the initial length, then of course there is, uh, as the simulation evolves, uh, this can vary. Okay, uh, is there any, I mean, um, time uh, the, the, the fruit takes to achieve a certain, is there any city state, or I mean, the, the fruit takes to achieve um, any time, I mean, to achieve the city state, or just, I mean, um, a flow like crossing, you know, the, the, um, the, the channel and there's no steady state. Perhaps I missed some. What, what do you mean by steady state? Steady state you know, if you have a poison flow, if uh, I understand partially what yes. you said, at some point, you know, you achieve a sort of steady state configuration, which is a parabolic structure of the flow. Uh, of velocity, of course. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, And the, the problem is not really, we are not in equilibrium. So uh, okay. the, there is not a, a right definition of steady state, but yeah, of course, uh, if, uh, if we measure uh, the, the, the velocity profile uh, inside the, the entrant flow in different regions, we see uh, the same uh, velocity profile. So we could say that the, 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 the possible flow is kind of steady, yes. Okay, okay. But yeah, there is this additional problem in, 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 in when there is a slip that as there is a conversion of fluid, then uh, depending on whether on where you, you are measuring uh, 
uh, the velocity profile, you can have a larger or a, or a smaller okay. uh, lubricant width. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. Thank you. Thank you for the nice reply. Yeah. Mm. Okay, if there are no further questions, I will. Um, uh, we can move to the next speaker, uh, Andre Matias from University of Lisbon. Uh, I'll give you the rights to. Um, give me one second. So, I think you can have the possibility to um, share the screen now, Andre. Yes, I can. Okay, just one second. Yeah, so. So for hopefully you now see my presentation. Yeah, we can, it's, it's clear, we can see it, yeah. So, okay. Um, so next speaker is uh, um, Andre Matias from University of Lisbon. Uh, we speak about uh, uh, dissolution and dispersion in swelling uh, porous media. So please. Okay, thank you very much. As, I, uh, as it was said, I'm, I'm Andre Matias, a PhD student from the University of Lisbon. And on this short presentation, I'll discuss some of the results that I obtained throughout my thesis. So uh, in several uh, examples across our daily life, we see a, a, a phenomena where mass is transported through a porous medium. We, we can see that, for example, when we are drawing biological uh, matter, where the porous medium that is, that, that is the biological matter um, evaporates water, and this water is then transported by the air to, uh, to, uh, away, from the, away from the organism. We can also find that when we are, for example, extracting an espresso, where we are forcing water through some coffee beans. And as we force the water, there is dissolution of, of key chemical compounds that are then transported by the water across the porous medium and we eventually end up on our coffee cup. But these problems of, of transport of mass across the porous medium is, is of uh, uh, very important in several chemical uh, experiments, for example, on chemical gardens, we have a solution that is reacting with some salt that we have. And during this reaction, we see the creation of these structures, um, these structures that arise due to the transport of the salt and transport of the mass across the solution. Or we can have, for example, chromatography, which is a, a chemical technique used to separate the different compounds that are present in a solution, where each compound reacts in a different way we, in this case, with paper, which is a porous medium. And since they react in a different way, as time moves on, we see that there is a separation of colors uh, depending on the concentration of each chemical compound. On these problems, uh, we can separate uh, the problem into two parts. First of all, we have a fluid that is transporting some solid. So we need to understand, first of all, the, the properties of the fluid, and second of all, the, the properties of the solid spread. Regarding the fluid, we can look at it as, for example, at the pore scale, where we have the Poisson equation that, uh, 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 well descri uh, that describes very well how a fluid flows across a pore in the porous medium. Or if we have a, a, a very large uh, a porous medium, we need to look at the macro scale where now the porous medium is treated such as a, a black box, where we know some key properties of, the, of it, such as the permeability and the pressure drop. And from these properties, we can derive uh, the velocity uh, across the porous medium. There are several works in the literature that try to relate the pore scale physics to the macro scale. And for example, if we, have the, if we know the distribution of sizes of the pores, we can have an idea what is the permeability and then determine at the velocity using the uh, using Darcy's law. A similar thing happens for the, sol uh, the solid. At the pore scale, if we solve the attraction diffusion equation, we can retrieve all the properties of the uh, of the solid. But then, once again, at the macro scale, we don't have uh, we cannot grasp all the properties of the of the of the of the fluids, and so we need to use effective diffusions and the average velocities to determine how the solid spreads. Regarding the solid, there has not been a lot of work uh, regarding uh, the relation between pore scale and the, and the macro scale. 
And furthermore, if we go one step further on the, uh, on the, on the complexity, we can have a situation where the solid influences uh, the, the, the solid matrix of the porous media, which will, uh, as a consequence, affect the fluid flow, as we saw, for example, on the chemical gardens. And so in my work, I think uh, I, I want to bridge this gap a little bit and to try to understand macroscopic properties of solid spread uh, coming from the, the pore scale model. To do so, I use numerical mod, uh, uh, met, uh, methods to, to, to study it. So I use the lattice Boltzmann method. And since most of you probably know fairly well how the lattice Boltzmann method works, I will only give you a few uh, uh, details about what I do differently. So first of all, in a porous medium, studying a fluid flow across a porous medium, medium it is very important to, uh, to know where the boundary it is located. So instead of using the BGK collision operator, I use the two relaxation time collision operator, since this one gives me the Friedman freedom to, to precisely uh, uh, to control the position of the boundary. Second of all, uh, since I'm interested in the laminar regime, I use an appropriate relaxation time. Regarding the boundaries, uh, for the particles, I use the non-slip boundary condition that I, uh, that I impose using maze ghost nodes. And I, I chose this method since, the, uh, since it allows me to place the boundary somewhere in between two nodes. And to do so, to do so this method uh, estimates the populations coming out of the solid by, uh, with the linear combination of the populations of the boundary node and of the closest fluid node. And to put the fluid into motion, I use the uh, I, I impose a, an inlet and outlet velocity that I impose using the zoo and hay boundary uh, uh, method, which um, imposes the, the the velocity at, at the boundary by determining what are the unknown uh, populations using a linear combination of, of the known populations and the the imposed velocity. So this is this was for the first part of the problem, which was determining. The, the fluid flow, but what about the solid spread? So if we put side by side the Navier-Stokes equation and the advection diffusion equation, we see that they share, uh, they, they are quite similar. And this hints to the fact that we can use the lattice Boltzmann method to recover not only the Navier-Stokes equation, but to, to recover the advection diffusion equation. And so that's what I have. I have two uh, lattice Boltzmann solvers running in parallel, and one recovers the navier stokes equation, and the other one recovers the advection diffusion equation. And I couple the two solvers. So for example, for the advection diffusion, the velocity of the fluid comes from the, 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 the solver for the fluid. So some details about this, uh, this implementation. So for consistency, I will, I will use the notation of the populations of, instead of using F, I will use G. So I use the simpler uh, BG key collision operator, and the, the, the main difference between these two methods is that now the relaxation time, instead of determining the velocity, determines what is the diffusion, uh, the molecular diffusion of the solid. And once again, I'm interested in low diffusion, so I chose an appropriate uh, relaxation time. Regarding the boundaries, I want my particles to be inert, inert so, so I use the bounce back. Uh, scheme for the, the interaction with the boundaries. And also I want to study a system where there is this solution of the chemical compounds. And to, to, to have this solution, I need to impose a flux of solids across the boundaries. So I have a boundary condition on, on the derivative of the concentration across the boundary. Traditionally, you can, uh, you can implement that by imposing directly the, 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 the derivative using the Namurus flux boundary condition which assumes that the populations coming out of the, of the boundary are at equilibrium with some, some, uh, some concentration that is determined based on the imposed flux, or you can transform the, the, the condition of the derivative into condition of the concentration at the wall by using the first order approximation of the derivative. And then you impose a concentration at the wall using the anti-bounce back uh, scheme. When I implement these two methods, I, I, I come across with a problem, which was that it, it is very hard to, to quantify how much solid it, it, it flows through the, um, through the boundary. And this led to problems with mass conservation. So instead of using these methods, I impose directly 
uh, a source term at the boundary nodes. So to, to impose the source term, I first need to determine how much the concentration varies, which I calculate using the flux and also the, the surface area of the nodes. And then I need to impose the, the source on, on the boundary nodes and to impose the source, it is a similar implementation to the way uh, we implement the force on the classical lattice Boltzmann. So I need to make a correction on the on the on the collision term, and I need to make a correction when we when I calculate the macroscopic concentration. So now back to the to the main problem. If I have the advection diffusion equation, I have three terms: one term for the diffusion, one term for the advection, and one term for the source. And if I'm looking at the uh, at the pore scale, such as this example, I know in full detail what is the velocity distribution across the system and also how the source uh, is at the system. But if I'm looking at the macro scale, now it's harder to grasp the full detail uh, necessary to, to, to solve this equation since I only have access, for example, to the average velocity across the porous medium. And so if I only have access to the average velocity across the porous medium, then I need to make some transformations to the equation. So now my velocity is the inlet velocity of the porous medium, and then I need to appropriately correct the, the other terms. And we need to understand how this, how the effective diffusion and the effective source term depends with the, uh, the velocity. So we look first at the, the effective diffusion. So I will very fast. I will go very fast through this because there are lots of uh, uh, um, articles on the literature about about the effective dissolution. But essentially, the simpler case where we have two parallel plates and we have some fluid flowing uh, across it, due to the to, due to the parabolic velocity profile, the solid will start from a bar and then will move into this shape. And if we calculate the diffusion across it and compare it uh, uh, the diffusion as function of the Peclet number, where the Peclet number relates the advective transport to the diffusive transport, we see that if the Peclet number is very small, then the effective diffusion is the same as the molecular diffusion. But if the Peclet number is very large, then the effective diffusion is, in, is enhanced due to, the, due to the velocity shear, due to the shear velocity, sorry. In fact, there is some analytical calculations that state that for this particular example, the effective diffusion grows with the Peclet uh, squared. So now to the, to the, to the other term, the, the source term. So as I said before, I want to, to study the dissolution and the dissolution arises due to a concentration gradient across the boundary of the particles. So on the surface of the particle, I have some, some uh, concentration and on the fluid, I have another concentration. And this concentration gradient will result on the source term. To simplify this, instead of, uh, 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 I put everything into a dissolution rate and I kept the, the, the concentration difference. So if I have a situation where I have point sources across the, the, so if I have point sources, sorry, something is not working, but anyway, oh, now it's working. So if I have point sources across my system uh, and I have fluid flowing from the top to the bottom, I see that the concentration will grow, uh, will start from zero and, and it will grow. And we can plot the concentration as function of the of the of the spatial coordinates on the steady state. On the steady state, and you see here that for different velocities, which are represented by the different colors, we see that as we increase the velocity, the concentration at the outlet uh, will decrease. And this is because we are washing out more uh, more solids by uh, and injecting at the same rate. And so. Uh, for this particular system where we have point sources, we can have an analytical solution for this, which I represent with the dashed lines and we see a good agreement. I will not show you the, the full equation for the analytical solution, this is quite an ugly equation, but I'll show you uh, uh, its behavior on two regimes. Uh, the first regime is when we have a very, uh, uh, very small Peclet number. So when we have a very small Peclet number, we, we can determine that the, the concentration at the outlet will, will be given by this and will depend on the dumb color number. 
and in this case the dump over number re relates the, the 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 reaction rates to the diffusive diffusion transport as we increase the pack lane number we see that at some point it uh, for large pack lane number the concentration at the outlet uh, decreases linearly with the pack lane number we can do the same thing for a, a more complex system where we have a bunch of circles that are dissolving. And in this case, the analytical solution also works out to, to give appropriate results, as you see here with the dashed lines and the, and the dotted lines. But I need to make some transformation, which is that the, the molecular diffusion needs to be corrected to the effective diffusion, which, are, which we can also analytically determine for this system. Finally, I'll, I'll end in a situation where I have this solution, but there is a limit to how much I can dissolve. So essentially, each particle is like a reservoir of solids that is being emptied as it dissolves. And so the concentration at the surf surface of the particle will decrease by the same rate as we are putting solids uh, into the fluid. Since now the concentration at the surface depends on time, now I have a new variable, which is time. And so if I look at the concentration as function of time, I can see that first of all, it increases, reaching a maximum, and then it starts to decrease. And I see that if I change the dumb color number, in this case, if I decrease the dumb color number, then the height of the maximum will change. It will change. We can, I will separate this into three parts. First of all, let's look at the maximum. So if I plot the maximum uh, uh, reach as function of the inlet velocity, I see that for low velocity, it reaches, it stabilizes to a value. But if I have a large velocity, then I see a linear regime, a, a, a close to linear region. And a similar thing happens when I vary the dissolution rate. For very small dissolution rates, the concentration of the maximum increases linearly, and then it stabilizes into some value. So with this, if we look just at the, at the, the parts where we can just a power law, uh, we can determine that the maximum will, will be the same as the dumb color number and the characteristic time, uh, there is a characteristic time to reach the maximum. And we, using this information, we can collapse all of the, the lines uh, fairly well. Finally, regarding the decay, uh, I can see that, uh, the, I can show that, that the concentration after reaches the maximum will decay exponentially fast and the velocity uh, that it decays will depend on the height of the maximum. Since I'm already almost so, uh, in overtime, I'll leave you with the conclusions, but just, just refer that the next steps will probably be to study this on a, on, a, on a more irregular distribution of obstacles where it's harder to determine the effective diffusions and, uh, and the velocities. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, for this nice talk. So we, are, we have a few minutes, a couple of minutes for questions. If you have any, please. In case, just raise your hand um, if you have questions. Okay, so I don't think there is any question for this talk. So let's thank um, Andre for this talk. And um, I think we can have a break now. There's coffee break of about 10 minutes. I'll see you in uh, at 16.40 for the next talk. So thank you very much for um, participating. Okay, so I think we can start with um, the second half.
of technical session number two. Uh, next speaker of the session is uh, James Spendlow from uh, um, University of um, Sheffield. Um, I think he's here. Yep. And they will speak about, yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay, I think you can share the screen. Uh, let me know. Fantastic. Can okay. you see that? Yeah. Right. So that old talk is a, a single, uh, no, it's uh, it's changed. So uh, modeling fluid field vesicles using chrome dynamic multi-component at this Boltzmann method. So please. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Uh, so I'm James Spenlove. I'm a PhD student at Sheffield Hallam University. And my presentation today is on the modeling of fluid field vesicles using chromodynamic multi-component lattice Boltzmann method. Okay, so I thought I'd mention my supervisory team quickly contributed towards this work. It's made up of Professor Ian Halliday, my Director of Studies, Dr. Juju, and Dr. Torsten Schenkel. So an outline of what I'm going to go through. Firstly, I'm going to introduce the modeling of red blood cells briefly, and then move on to one of the focuses of this presentation, which is the methodology or the chromodynamic methodology, the membrane forces applied, and the calculation of specific surface metrics. From this, we'll move on to results, looking at steady state and dynamical data tailored towards red blood cell simulations, and then talk about the many fluid extensions of this work and finally draw conclusions and future directions. Okay, so an introduction to modeling red blood cells. Obviously the simulation and modeling of red blood cells has various biomedical applications and importance. There are already a couple of lattice Boltzmann method approaches to simulating red blood cells in literature. And many of them use single component lattice Boltzmann method to describe the fluid another solver to describe the deformable body or membrane of the red blood cell, and then a methodology of pairing the two together, with the one cited there being that of Tim Kruger, which uses lattice Boltzmann method for the fluid, finite element method to describe the membrane of the red blood cell, and then immersed boundary method to pair the two together. The approach I'm gonna talk about here that we've developed is a single framework methodology in that it only uses multi-component lattice Boltzmann method to describe the fluids and the deformable body of the red blood cell. The modeling assumptions used is that we treat a red blood cell as a vesicle, as shown there on the right, where that shows the approximate length scale of a healthy human red blood cell, where the membrane has units of nanometers, so it's taken to be a quasi two-dimensional surface. So the methodology used is the chromodynamic multi-component lattice Boltzmann method. So I thought I'd quickly outline that on this slide. So what we do for a two-component case is define two immiscible fluids, a red and a blue fluid. The red fluid describes the interior of the red blood cell, the cytoplasm. The blue fluid describes the exterior of the red blood cell, the plasma, and there's an interfacial region between the two. This diffused interfacial region is given by a phase field or row n contour and shown in two dimensions at the bottom here by the black line, where when row n equals one, it means you're in the interior of the red blood cell. When row n equals minus one, it means you're in the exterior. And any value between one and minus one means you're in this interfacial region between the fluids where a central contour at row n equals zero corresponds to the surface of that vesicle. So this interfacial region is extremely important as it's obviously where we characterize the surface as, but it's also where we apply these membrane forces in order to get vesicle behavior. And they're applied in this region via goo forcing. So a full methodological outline of the steps for the two component case, to run through these is firstly, we define the immiscible fluid. So split the distribution function up into the red and blue contributions. From this, we calculate the densities of the fluids in the phase field. If it wants to work. So we calculate where C is the species. So C is R or B. And then from this, we can calculate the phase field over the lattice. Then we calculate the unit normal by taking the gradient of that phase field, which defines the surface as shown here. And that's used later in the segregation stage. We then calculate the force contributions, which I'll come on to on the next slide, which are the target area or area conservation, surface tension and bending rigidity forces. Once these are calculated, we can calculate the lattice velocity by a goo forcing. So using that force contribution in addition here. Then obviously we collide the distribution functions, which we do in the model using an MRT collision scheme. Post collision, we apply a segregation rule to the fluid. So again, C is red or blue, plus or minus corresponds to the red or the blue fluid. And beta is an interfacial tension parameter and N is the unit normal to the surface pointed from the red to the blue fluid. Finally, we propagate the distribution functions and then it loops around again at the next time step back to the calculating densities in the phase field. 
Okay, so looking at the membrane forces in a little bit more detail. So we need to apply these membrane forces to get the vesicle behavior, which will then tune towards red blood cell dynamics. The first force we apply is an area conservation force that aims to conserve the cross-sectional area of the vesicle during simulation. So here, A0 is the target area of the vesicle, which in simulation, we initialize a sphere, which we deflate to this target area, A0, and compare against the actual area in simulation, A, with this force aiming to constrain that target area. We then apply a bending rigidity force, which reflects the membrane's resistance to bending, where kappa B is a bending rigidity parameter. And we also apply a surface tension force, which is the exact same as you see within drop physics or drop modeling, which is obviously related to the intercircular forces at the free surface between the fluids, where sigma is the surface tension parameter. And also this force is extremely useful when looking at extending the model to many fluids, which I'll come on to shortly. Therefore, the total force contribution is given by the summation of the area conservation, bending rigidity and target area, all weighted by the gradient of the phase field to ensure local application within that interfacial region. So the takeaway from this slide is we apply three forces which give us vesicle behavior within that interfacial region. And the three parameters which we could tune are the surface tension, bending rigidity and target area. The other takeaway is that these forces depend upon the mean and Gaussian curvatures of the surface of the vesicle, especially if you look at the bending rigidity, which has terms of mean and Gaussian curvature within it. So in order to compute these forces, we need to compute a methodology of calculating these curvatures. So to do this, we calculate the surface curvatures purely from the unit normal of the surface, which is already being calculated. So the figure at the bottom shows the differential geometry in question, where the z-axis aligns with the unit normal to the surface and the x-y-axis span the tangent plane of that surface, where this monge patch here represents a small sample or excerpt of vesicle surface given by z is equal to fxy. So the steps for computing the surface curvatures are Firstly, find a local surface tangent plane basis in terms of the global normal measurement n, unit normal, which we already calculate. We then apply an Euler rotation such that the tangent axes align with the principal curvatures of the surface. From this, we can identify the definitions of those principal curvatures, kappa one and kappa two, and then finally calculate the mean and Gaussian curvatures needed to compute those membrane forces on the previous slide. Okay, so the first thing we do is define three different frames. We've got simulation or laboratory frame, where we know the unit normal to the surface n, which is being calculated. We've got the surface general frame, shown by this image on the left, where the z-axis aligns with the unit normal to the surface, and the x-y-axis span the tangent plane of that surface. And we've then got a surface-specific frame, sigma dash, where z-axis aligns with the unit normal to the surface, the x-y-axis also span the tangent plane, However, they now align with the principal curvatures, kappa one and kappa two of the surface where the normal curvatures are minimized and maximized at that point. Okay, so we tailor expand the surface or the monge patch of the surface, fxy, about the point P as shown there, which I'll mention in the next slide. But the first step is to relate the laboratory normal N from simulation to the general surface plane shown on the left. To do this, we've chosen the z-axis to align with the unit normal of the surface, so that's easy to define. And then the non-unique tangent plane is defined as such, where the x-axis is defined when dotted onto the z-axis equals zero, and then found the y-axis by crossing the x and the z-axis together. So this results in a definition of the surface general frame shown on the left here, purely from the unit normal in simulation. What we now want to do is rotate about the z-axis such that the x, y-axis align with the principal curvatures, kappa one and kappa two of the surface. So to do this, we write down that Taylor expanded surface definition in matrix form, where A, B, and C are the second order derivatives evaluated at the point P. We then apply an Euler rotation around that z-axis such that the general plane becomes the specific plane. So rotating about that z-axis after a few mathematical steps results in a new definition of the surface in terms of the specific frame, x dash, y dash, and z dash where now we've defined a rotation matrix RZ alpha. So we need to rotate by an angle alpha such that the X, Y axis align with the principal curvatures of that surface. So how far do we need to rotate by that angle alpha? Well, we need to rotate such that the cross term in the Taylor expansion, the X, Y term or the C derivative equals zero, as this will only be the case if the axes align with the principal curvatures of the surface. So from this, we can define the alpha 
And then therefore we can define the principal curvature as kappa one and kappa two of the surface. So now we've found the principal curvature is purely from the unit normal, which was already being calculated within simulation. From this, we can therefore just define the mean and Gaussian curvatures using the definitions and therefore use these to compute the membrane forces shown on the previous slide. So this was a methodology of computing surface curvatures needed to define the membrane forces, which we need to incite vesicle behavior. Okay, so now moving on to results. In steady state, so zero flow, what we're looking at is simulating a vesicle representative of a bicuspid, so a red blood cell shape. So as discussed, there's three forces which affect vesicle shape and three parameters, which are the target area, the surface tension and the bending rigidity. So we fix the target area and vary the surface tension and bending rigidity parameters, where this result shows a small sample phase space from that selection. Here we've got a range of shapes from oblate vesicles, prolate vesicles and non-axial symmetric vesicles. However, the shapes highlighted in yellow correspond to those which qualitatively represent that of a healthy human red blood cell. To quantify this, we took a slice through one of the parameterizations and compared the top quadrant of that slice against Evans's parametric expression for an erythrocyte. So as you can see, you've got our data in orange and Evans's expression in black, and it shows a pretty good fit, showing that quantitatively we recovered a correct shape representative of a human red blood cell. This obviously tells us no information about the dynamics, however, of the model. So to look at the dynamics, we looked at the Wheeler test or Wheeler experiment. Here, a single red blood cell is sheared perpendicular to its axis of rotation. So as shown in this video, which causes the red blood cell to deform. This is then done at increasing shear rates, as can be seen, and the deformation index calculated for these shear rates, where D max is the maximal diameter of the vesicle or red blood cell post shear, and D naught is the original diameter of the vesicle before you apply the shear. So the results on the right show this, where the red line shows the results from a given parameterization of our model. The green error bars corresponds to experimental data, and the three other black lines correspond to other models within literature, where if you want more information about those models, see citation two where they're referenced. So as you can see, our model generally fits that of the experimental data quite well. It does seem to lift off at the lower shear rates, and the reasoning for this is the fact that in steady state, the diameter of our vesicle or red blood cell shape, the semi-minor and semi-major diameters aren't quite equal due to the resolution and parameterization used. So therefore we average this D naught value from this, which results in a slightly overestimation of the shear rate. But generally shows a good fit to experimental data showing that we could recover known red blood cell behavior for this test. But to show that we did average this value, we show the gray shaded region, which corresponds to this error but also to the fact that the red line is just a given parameterization, where we find quite a few other parameterizations which fit this experimental data. Although I'm not gonna go into detail, we also looked at a shear recovery test where we apply a much larger shear rate to this vesicle or red blood cell causing it to deform. And we then turn this off to watch the vesicle or red blood cell recover back to its initial shape. So this was a really good result showing the robustness and stability of the model far from mechanical equilibrium. So now looking at the many fluid extensions of this. So this works based off that of you and Etel, where imagining now a triple contact between two vesicles, where you've got vesicle one, vesicle two, and some plasma. And at some point in simulation, the two vesicles want to come into contact. The assumptions we make is that we want complete immiscibility between the vesicles. So we're not interested in any wetting effects. And also we initialize them in simulation such that the two vesicles do not have an interface with each other. So basically that just means we've got plasma or background fluid between the vesicles. So the two steps to ensuring immiscibility is to avoid a triple contact by using a variable surface tension. So the surface tension between the vesicles and the plasma is set to sigma naught, whereas the surface tension between the two vesicles is set to at least two times greater than that between the, uh, the plasma and the vesicles. This ensures again, a triple contact or numerous triangle does not form. We also use a variable interfacial width parameter beta. So the interfacial width between, or interfacial width parameter, sorry, between the plasma and the vesicles is decreased as a triple contact wants to form. This stops or increases the interfacial width between the vesicles and the plasma. Whereas the interfacial parameter between the two vesicles, we increase as a triple contact wants to form, which decreases the interfacial width between the vesicles. 
So in theory, both of these steps should ensure miscibility between our simulated red blood cells. To test this, we initially looked at a vesicle vesicle interaction. So here we've got two bicuspid vesicles overlapping by their radius and are pushed towards each other by a buoyancy force in opposing directions. So the color in this video corresponds to the surface area of the vesicle. So as you can see, the vesicles move towards each other and they start to deform and move around each other. So they avoid coalescence and maintain a liquid layer between, of background fluid between the two vesicles. So this was a good result showing that the assumptions made on the previous slide were working and that the vesicles generally maintain their bicuspid profile whilst remaining immiscible and having no coalescence. You do see, however, there is a fluctuation in color you know, throughout this video, which is a change in the surface area. However, this change in surface area, if you look at the values, is really small relative to the target area. So a change in area of less than 1%. So an initial good result of the scaling to many vesicles. We then looked at extending this recently to a five fluid, four bicuspid vesicle sedimentation test. So here the results on the right show initialization, increasing time steps on the right, where we initialize four bicuspid vesicles in a solid domain. So each wall has no slip bounce back bunch conditions and a negative buoyancy force is applied to all the vesicles. This causes the vesicles to sediment and form on top of each other, where the good result was there was you know, no coalescence between the vesicles, they maintain immiscibility and generally retain their bicuspid shape, even under quite large flow stresses, such as you can see here, where you've got buoyancy forces pushing down between a solid uh, boundary at the bottom. So a quite a good result there. There is, however, a fluctuation in area, as you can see by the change in color within this data, with a maximal fluctuation throughout simulation of around 6%. So I believe this is currently a problem with how it's coded, uh, which is something I'm working on at the moment of implementing an updated area conservation force in the code. But generally, again, a good result showing complete immiscibility and stability of the code. So what are the current limitations when extending to many fluids? So we're currently just on five. Well, this is due to the increased complexity and expense. So firstly, you need to define a phase field between each fluid pair. So for an N fluid simulation, the number of interfaces needed to be defined is N, N minus one, all over two. And also the need segregation term for each fluid. So for that five fluid system on the previous slide, the segregation of say fluid one is defined as follows, where we segregate fluid one against fluid two, fluid one against fluid three, fluid one against fluid four, and fluid one against fluid five. So obviously as we go up to 10, 20, 50, 100 fluids, this is gonna increase in complexity. I mean, there are shortcuts you could do in the coding side to decrease computational cost and complexity, but generally this is gonna get a bit more complex. So future work will look at under the assumption that the fluids are completely immiscible, reducing the number of fluids to the same as the number of interfaces. So we want to go from N, N minus one all over two interfaces to N interfaces by redefining that phase field between the fluids. So we define one fluid against all the fluids in a single step. This will mean that we can reduce the number of segregation terms to a single term per fluid. Although it won't necessarily take this form, I just wanted to highlight it. So we just get a single term here instead of the five terms you had previously, which will obviously both these steps will increase transparency, the methodology, and also uh, increase uh, computational performance. We also want to look at applying the current model to single or dual red blood cell flows, with ideal applications being infected red blood cells, such as malaria infections, which cause the dynamics of the red blood cell to change, where the high tunability of the model lends itself to this area, where we'd want to look at things such as flows in narrow passageways and stenosed passageways, where the stability of the model could be tested further. So in conclusion, what was developed, a model for simulating fluid filled vesicles in three dimensions was developed using a single framework methodology. So it only needed one methodology for both the fluids and the deformable body. This was then tailored towards red blood cell applications by tuning of the force constants. How was the model been tested? I'm not going into the resolution test in this presentation, but we've looked at compliance with Gauss 1A theorem, as well as grid convergence tests. In zero flow, we've looked at examining the phase space with, in this presentation, I've shown the recovery of a correct bicuspid profile representative of red blood cell. Dynamically, we looked at the Wheeler test, so looked at recovering known red blood cell behavior when exposed to a shear and also briefly showed a shear recovery test where the vesicle was stretched far from mechanical equilibrium and left to recover back to its initial shape. Initially, we've shown two multi-vesicle simulations, so a head-on collision between two vesicles, and also a five-fluid, four-bicuspid vesicle sedimentation test. 
where the results showed that the vesicles remained immiscible, avoiding coalescence and trying to retain their bicuspid shape even under flow stresses. So what are the strengths of the developed model? Well, its single framework approach makes it transparent and easy to understand. Its tunability in the variable surface tensions can be implemented quite easily and the force constants can be tuned. It's robust and stable far from mechanical equilibrium and benefits from all the advantages of chromodynamic lattice Boltzmann method. And also the fact it's got this automatically adaptive interface due to it being a diffuse interface model, meaning that if resolution is okay in steady state, it should be completely fine during simulation as the interface deforms with the fluids. So if you want any more information on what I've gone through today, uh, citation number two there encapsulates the development of this methodology and there are the other references that I've used throughout. So thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, thank you, James, for a nice presentation. Uh, I think we may have time only for a single quick question since we are already a little bit over time. Oh, yeah. So if there is any, otherwise we can move to the next. Okay, so I think there are no questions. So let's thank again, James, for the presentation. And um, next speakers, last one of this uh, parallel session is uh, Francesca Perusi from University of Rome, Tor Vergata. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, I think you can share the screen. Yeah. Should have the right to do that. I think she would speak about um, de-wetting properties of a liquid film um, via multi-component lattice bolts simulations. So please, yeah. Francesca. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Just uh, um, a little correction to the chair, because now I'm currently working as a researcher at the Hermos Institute in Langen-Nuremberg in Germany. <laughs> but don't worry. <laughs> OK, so today I will talk about uh, the de-wetting properties of a liquid film via multi-component lattice Boltzmann simulations. So the de-wetting is a um, dynamics that we can observe in our ordinary life, but uh, in particular, it has uh, a lot of technological applications, for example, in catalysis, nanophotonics, and also coding processes. Uh, the de-wetting is uh, can be uh, defined as the reverse process of the spontaneous spreading of liquid in contact with the solid surface, as you can see here in this uh, very recent experimental video. And it uh, uh, usually takes place when the liquid film is forced to stay in contact uh, with the uh, surface, and, and this surface is uh, partially wettable. Uh, from the thermodynamical point of view, uh, thin film uh, it can be considered as in a metastable state because uh, if you measure uh, the surface free energy, this uh, can be reduced if the, the same amount of liquid is uh, collecting within a droplet with a spherical shape instead of a liquid film. Um, there exists more than one de-wetting uh, mechanism, but we are uh, interested uh, just in uh, the spinoidal de-wetting that regards uh, films with the thickness in the range of uh, microscopic interactions, so between uh, 2 and 10 nanometers. And uh, uh, it is known that uh, spinoidal de-wetting induces linear instability. So the main aim of this work is to study the stability conditions in this kind of uh, uh, dynamics. In order to do that, we perform uh, numerical simulations via multi-component lattice Boltzmann simulations. In particular, this was uh, the first time a multi-component lattice Boltzmann model is used uh, with this aim. So me here just to uh, briefly summarize the key points of the model. We are dealing with a multi-component model. So we associate a uh, probability distribution function F that gives us the probability to find a single particle in a certain node on the lattice in a given time. And we associate one uh, probability distribution function to each component. So let's say the, the, in this case, we have two components, the fluid A and the fluid B. 
The dynamics of both components is ruled by uh, the lattice boson equation here with this um, streaming step. So the propagation through the lattice is possible for F uh, via the introduction of a discrete set of velocity CI that uh, depends on the model. And then we have the collision term. Uh, in particular, I use the, the collision um, operator in the BGK approximation, as you can see here. So we have that the probability distribution function relaxed to the equilibrium one in a certain uh, time uh, tau. Um, we know that uh, by using the lattice Boltzmann simulation, we have uh, we, we can access to uh, the microscopical fields of density and velocity in a, a direct way, starting from the knowledge on the probability distribution function f. And in, in order to study uh, this kind of dynamics, the, the wetting dynamics, we need to include in the model also some uh, interaction. So for uh, a couple of forces. So first of all, we include uh, fluid fluid cohesion interaction uh, in order to uh, absorb the, the, the phase separation between the two components, uh, components A and B. And uh, we use the, the shan shell uh, model um, in a, to, to write, to uh, include the force uh, in our model. Um, an important parameter here is the uh, coupling strength, G. We can call it GAB due to the two components. And it is uh, um, the, the intensity of the, of the strength of our, of our forces. And we know that uh, GAB governs the fluid fluid surface, inter, uh, surface tension. Sorry. In fact, we can also measure the surface tension by uh, changing the, the strength, GAB. And then we need to include in our model also a uh, fluid solid addition interaction uh, due to the problem we are uh, dealing with. In this case, we change a bit the shape of uh, the force and we introduce uh, not one, but two uh, coupling parameters that we call GWA and GWD that again are uh, the intensities of the two uh, strengths. So fluid one uh, wall and uh, fluid two with the wall. And we know that they govern the fluid solid surface tension, even if we can't um, directly measure uh, these two observables. So the main features here in this model are that uh, these three coupling parameters are tunable in our model, so we can change the surface tensions, but we have to take uh, uh, into account that uh, by using the Shanshe model, we are dealing with a, a model that provides a diffusive interface, so not a sharp interface. The order zero, uh, order zero step is to benchmark uh, the numerical method. So first of all, we compared our results with uh, what is known in the literature for all the uh, previous uh, um, Shanshen uh, lattice Boltzmann model, multi-component. And then um, we found a very good agreement with the numerics. So uh, maybe the uh, more important, more interesting thing is to compare uh, our results with both um, experiments and theory. So regarding a benchmark with the experiments, we performed the same experiments uh, done by Bert and co-workers. They uh, prepare uh, single uh, liquid droplets in contact with, um, with a flat wall with uh, an initial radius capital R, and they uh, waited by measuring the radius of the contact area, RT. In this kind of experiment, they changed both the initial radius, capital R, and the uh, wetting conditions or the, the contact angle. And they observed that uh, if you plot the radius of the contact area as a function of time for both different uh, initial radius and different contact angles, uh, there is a spreading of all the data. But if you uh, correctly normalize your observable, so the radius of the contact area normalized with the initial radius and the time normalized with a characteristic wetting time, defined in terms of uh, uh, the, um, the density of the liquid droplets and the surface tension, you can observe a collapse of your data. And this collapse depends only on the, uh, on the contact angle. If uh, we perform, again, the same kind of experiment with our 
multi-component lattice boson model, we obtain um, pretty the same result. So we can be um, sure our model is working well. The second comparison is with the theory, in particular regarding the, um, the wetting dynamics, not the wetting. Um, typically, people describe uh, the dynamics of the height of the liquid film in contact with the solid wall and the, the wetting process via the thin film equation. Uh, there exist two kinds of thin film equations, the deterministic and the stochastic one, but both born from a list of assumptions. So first of all, the inertia is neglected. Uh, they uh, deal with uh, small contact angles and very thin fins, and the sharp is interfa uh, the interface is sharp. So you can see that there are some differences between the uh, hydrodynamics uh, that we, we can observe from our lattice buffer simulations and the thin film equation. Um, both uh, the thin film equations, deterministic and stochastic, um, are ruled by the dynamic viscosity, the surface tension, and the disjoint pressure. In particular, the disjoint pressure plays a very important role because uh, it includes the uh, Van der Waals interactions, and so it controls the wetting conditions. In particular, the first deriv derivative can be related to the second derivative of the effective interface potential. And we know that the stability conditions of a uh, liquid film in contact with a, a solid wall um, can be predicted by looking at the uh, sign of the second derivative of the effective interface potential. So stable modes are observed when it is positive and unstable modes when it is negative. The difference between uh, the deterministic and the stochastic one is just the addiction in the second case of uh, some thermal fluctuations. And the reason of this addiction is uh, uh, in principle related to the, um, the the better agreement between the thin film equation with the experiments in this case. But um, the role of the, the, of the DH John impression is the same in both cases. And now we want, we'd like to have uh, a link between uh, uh, results obtained from our lattice bolsa simulations with the um, thin film theory. So with this aim, we perform simulations, in particular for the sake of simplicity, 2D simulations, preparing the liquid film with an initial height H0 in a system with a size L, and we perturb the interface of the, of the film by perturbing the density uh, in the range of nodes within the interface itself. This is uh, due to the fact that we can't manage uh, directly the height of the liquid film as uh, is done in the, in the case of the thin film equation, but we can uh, just uh, perturb uh, the density uh, in our lattice Boltzmann simulations. Uh, the interface is uh, um, diffusive. This is the reason why we uh, apply the perturbation within the, the width of the interface. The perturbation is very, very small. So um, it means that we are uh, perturbing, slightly perturbing the, the height of the interface. And here in this video, you saw also uh, an example of, uh, that came from our simulations. When we uh, wait, if we wait enough, we observe the breakup of the liquid film in a single droplet. And this is the result of our numerical mode with no addiction of, um, of thermal fluctuations. Then we uh, measure the profiles, so the, the, the interface profiles, and uh, as a function of time. And we consider just instance before the rupture of the liquid film. For this instance, we compare the power spectra uh, coming from our lattice Boltzmann data with those of the thin film equation. And we observe a, a good agreement between, uh, between the two, but in particular with the deterministic one. And it, and it is um, a very good result because um, in this way, we are sure that our lattice Boltzmann simulation shows a linear instability behavior for these uh, thin liquid films as predicted by the deterministic thin film equation uh, with no, um, introduction of thermal fluctuations. 
And at the end, after this uh, uh, preliminary work, we studied the tilt film stability, so and the breakup of a liquid film into droplets by varying what? So first of all, uh, the decoupling parameters, so the, the intensity of the uh, cohesion and addition uh, forces. That means our coupling parameter GAB, GWB, and GWA, that, as I said before, are related to the surface tensions, so um, wetting conditions and the surface tension between the two fluids. And we changed also the initial height of the liquid film. Starting from this configuration, by fixing the size of the system L and the uh, amplitude of the initial perturbation, we studied the um, stability di diagram. So here I show you the initial height of the liquid film normalized to uh, the system size, and the, uh, in relation to the um, coupling parameter JB, so the surface tension. Um, and we can distinguish three main regions. So the first of all, the first region is the mixing one. In this case, we have situation in which the surface tension is not strong enough to win against the uh, evaporation or uh, in our case, the, the mixing of the two components. Then we have a second region, the metal stable one, where at, at least one wetting condition exists to uh, trigger the breakup of the liquid film into a uh, droplet. And the last one, so the stable uh, region where uh, no uh, droplet breakup is observed. In particular, what I mean with at least one wetting condition. So if you zoom in one of these uh, uh, intermediate points, the circles, you can see that for each of them, you can um, construct a second two-phase diagram by relating the, the wetting conditions, so the coupling parameters GAB and GWB, uh, with the contact angle measure after the breakup. So we can see that for each point here, we have a large number of uh, combinations of uh, different uh, wetting conditions that uh, trigger the, the breakup the rupture of the liquid film. An interesting thing is to study how this uh, um, phase diagram uh, changes by changing, uh, by, by fixing, for example, the surface tension, so GAB, and change the initial height of the liquid film, and the opposite uh, situation. So starting by fixing the uh, surface tension and changing the initial height of uh, liquid film, we can move from the situation in which uh, uh, only mixing is, is observed. So we don't have, uh, we have no measure of the contact angle at the end. But if you increase the initial height of the liquid film, you can count uh, a large number of uh, uh, possibilities of conditions, wetting conditions, to trigger the, um, the rupture of the liquid film, so the, the wetting. The, this number of combination is observed to uh, decrease by increasing the uh, initial height of the liquid film. And the same behavior is observed in the opposite situation. So if you fix the initial height of the liquid uh, film and you change the surface tension, so the coupling GAB parameter. Again, we have the mixing uh, condition for very low value of the surface tension. If you increase the surface tension, then you can observe the transition. So the rupture, the break up into droplets of your liquid film, but the number of wetting condition uh, decreases again at increasing uh, the surface tension. So to summarize, we studied for the first time the wetting dynamics of a thin liquid film in contact with a flat wall in this case, we have multi-component lattice Boltzmann model. Uh, first of all, as a order zero level, we uh, benchmark the middle with numerics experiments and theory, as I uh, showed you before. And we observed that uh, three phase, but we could call it also four phase diagram is necessary to uh, know what, uh, which are the conditions to observe uh, or which are the conditions that triggers the um, breakup of our liquid film into droplets. Uh, now, uh, in, in the last days, we are trying to uh, link the stability uh, studied uh, by perturbing our uh, 
the interface of our liquid film with the thermodynamics. And the idea is to measure the effective interface potential as uh, uh, done by both experimentalists and, uh, um, and in the thin film uh, equation theory, and uh, try to predict the stability condition as a function of the initial height and a changing uh, wetting condition, but it's just an ongoing work, so it's not finished. And for food plants, uh, we want to move to 3D simulations and to rough and porous structure instead of a flat wall. And the, the reason of, um, of this uh, to-do list is, uh, is because we are um, cooperating with some experimental groups at the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, here in Erlangen. And uh, uh, we are cooperating all together within the uh, clean project uh, that uh, has the aim to study uh, stability conditions and uh, uh, wetting, the wetting processes and so on in order to uh, improve the uh, catalytic supports. So thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much, Francesca, for this very nice presentation. Uh, I think we have time for a quick question uh, since next talk is uh, starting almost. So if you have any, please. Um, Hello. Matt. Yeah. Hello. Hi, this is Kai. Uh, hi, Francisca. Very nice talk. Thank so, you so much. <laughs> yeah, very nice. I like a lot. So you mentioned like it, uh, you also have the evaporation process in your simulation. How do you take care of that? Uh, okay, it's it's not um, okay. I cited it as a uh, evaporation uh, process, but it's just a mixing of the two components. So in these conditions here, we uh, don't observe the uh, the separation of the two components because of the thickness of the liquid film is too low and the surface tension is not so strong to um, promote the, the phase separation. I call it mixing instead of evapor evaporation because in, the, um, in this version of our uh, model, we didn't implement uh, some uh, evaporation boundary conditions. So this is the reason why I called it mixing instead of uh, evaporation. Okay. So, Thank you. Thank you too for the question. Okay, if there is no other question, uh, we can thank again Francesca for a nice talk. Um, and before moving to the thank you too. session, there is a, thank you Francesca, there is a quick announcement for tomorrow. So uh, the, um, uh, the, the session in uh, Sala Palma, this one, we start at 10.40 uh, with second talk since the, the first one is canceled which was uh, at 10.20. So the next talk from tomorrow will start at 10.40. Thank you very much for all of you for uh, coming along today. And uh, we can move to the other room for the plenary talk. Bye.